All right. Uh, so I just, to finish on, there's nothing about what people's expectations are in terms of the... Because we're not asking people to do this. We're only asking the town, the, town, the, the legislative body, and the agencies. So this is not... Okay, so we have FTE. We on. could have done a Castleton poll before they closed, and it would have cost us a minimum of $25,000. What do you mean a Castleton poll? Well, they've closed. Yeah. They've closed the ability to hire them to do a they've poll. Closed it's poll. Business. They're, they're, yes. The university's closed it. Castleton closed it down because they, it Couldn't was a drag so on their budget resources. Problems. Wow. So not enough people engage them in doing it? I guess. Well, it's more that the student population is not where it needs to be to oh, fund it. It didn't ever make money. That's really too bad. It was a very useful tool for lots of different Oh, I hadn't realized that. But it would have cost us a minimum of 25. Oh, okay. oh yeah. To do oh, no, it's not okay. free. All right. Who wants to talk to us about age 625? Um, we are uh, at the point where we. Thank you. 624. All right. Do you have something new to say today? No. Okay. Now, of course, you remember I was here last Thursday. And I just identify yourself. A Ron Merkin, uh, Montpelier resident. So I was here last Thursday, and I testimonied in favor of a uh, bill that would be as restrictive as possible. And in response, you mentioned something that I thought was interesting. You said that uh, Vermont has a very high percentage of voter turnout, which was impressive. But uh, after that, I uh, thought, is there any empirical evidence, frankly, between that, uh, that voter turnout in Montpelier and the ability of political parties to reach uh, their constituency with leaflets and with other information to try and get them to vote for their candidates? So it, to research that, I went on the internet. I could not find any studies that had been done about that. I also spoke with a sociologist who's a friend of mine. He said uh, he wasn't aware of it, but to be sure, he researched it more thoroughly in terms of his expertise as a sociologist, he could not find ev any evidence, frankly, that there's any connection between the voter turnout, which is above average, admittedly, than other states. It's still pretty low. Well, it's, it's low, but as far as I know, it, it is uh, better than compared to a lot of other states. But um, he couldn't find any connection at all on the internet or any other, talking with his colleagues or looking through his, his professional literature, uh, that there was any connection at all between that. So, uh, so to make an argument that that, uh, that should be modified, that shouldn't be so restrictive, the uh, the uh, accessibility to information on that basis, from what I've seen, it's it's not really substantiated. Uh, well, yeah. I I guess I I thought I characterized the argument differently. But we that the discussion had been about in other states only parties, for instance, can have access to the full checklist. And my comment was that <coughs> our voters routinely have the highest percentage of electing and voting outside of the two parties. We, of course, have an independent senator. We have more independents and more third party officials in this state than I believe every other state in the country. And so, the concern I was expressing was not about voter turnout, but that we need to acknowledge, I believe, that the voters in Vermont are interested in more than Democrats and Republicans. And, and so it was in that context, but it is, so that, just to, to be clear about that. Yeah. No, I understand it, but it's still, I mean, just as one person, I'm not sure that that would be of significant importance enough to uh, to modify this bill and make it make the accessibility still what it was, especially in today's world, with what's going on. Uh, and then, yeah. Is yeah. your point that we should res further restrict the access to the, the checklist? And if so, who would you restrict it to? Who could have access to it? Well, actually, I got an email from somebody today, or no, I guess with it two days ago. And she made a very interesting um, observation, a very interesting suggestion, that it should be restricted to everyone 
except in criminal cases. Which, yeah. What, I, 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 no, I, mm -hmm. I think I didn't state that right. We have a voter checklist. Mm -hmm. Who should have access to that voter checklist? That's a very good question. I'm not sure. Well, but, that's yeah. what you're saying that we should restrict access mm -hmm. to it. And so who would you suggest should have access? Uh, anybody who needs it for legal purposes only. And one example would be in cases of criminal Why would they need a, access to the voter checklist for criminal cases? Uh, if, if there's if there's something that um, that someone that has committed a crime, yeah, yeah and uh, the, the police department needs more information about them, their address, for instance, and their. their well, I yeah. think they probably can get it other places than the voter checklist. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But See, this the person who wrote this did not really specify. She didn't go into detail about but, it so on the surface. Saying, yeah. You're saying that we should restrict access to it, and from everyone from the general public, I would think yes. And and. So who would have access? That's my yeah. question. Well, that's, pardon me. Who, yeah. who, who would, would, have, who access? would okay. have access if you had your way? Who would have access to the checklist? Just authorities who need it for, for legal. Okay, I, do, I don't know specifically. I can't tell you who those authorities would be. Yeah. But, okay. but what about candidates? Not, no, no I, don't, I don't think they should actually. Okay. But as I said, I wondered about that until I did this research myself and couldn't find any results and then talked with a sociologist friend of mine who had also did research, and he didn't find, uh, from the research that he did, that it would make any difference in how many people voted or who they voted for. Okay. Thank you. Okay. There was another thing that I wanted to bring up okay. related to that also, that uh, the, um, the political parties who are pushing this so much, and they, they really feel they need access to all this information to, in order to uh, promote their campaigns, et cetera, might keep in mind that uh, a, a, an issue that's becoming more and more in the minds of the average voter, I would say, today is, is uh, privacy, especially when a major credit bureau last year, I think, uh, reported they had billions of people, their cover, and this morning I was on the internet and something came up that billions of uh, information of Yahoo uh, subscribers had been, had been stolen. So I think political Thanks. parties who were so concerned that this would compromise their ability to influence voters should keep that in mind also. There was a neighbor of mine a few years ago. We were getting uh, leaflets uh, for a full month before an election from one candidate every single day. He got so angry about it that he saved them all, and despite the fact that he agreed with this particular candidate from what he told me, and he was from the party that he would belong to, he put them in an envelope with a covering note saying, this is why I did not vote for you. So privacy is something that I think that uh, should be taken into consideration equally by all these political parties who are so concerned about having access to voter information. If I, I can, the, uh, anything that in Vermont, anything that's generated as in, um, in, in government business, any document that's generated in, is considered a public record. No. Um, and a checklist is one of those. It is considered a public record, and it's always been a public record, and everybody has had access to it. So by restricting it, we are, we are making dramatic changes. It's always been a public record. Just yeah, to I know, but that's why we were okay. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. okay. Sorry. We, no, we get your point that you think it should be restricted. I think that we'll hear from others that it shouldn't be. So. Okay, but the, the whole point is that the three uh, conditions under which you can, uh, you know, re release them, providing somebody f assigns a form saying that they will not use yes. it for those conditions, there are loopholes, and there. This was discussed by you before I spoke last time. Right. But there are so many ways to get around them. So I think that those those conditions should be restricted dramatically or even eliminated. We get that. Okay. Thank you. And this time I. Put another thing on front porch form. I got five answers this time. Uh, one person said she would have been here, but she's out of town. The other people couldn't come because it was on the lunch hour and they had to get back to work, etc. But they all were supportive of this and very okay. Thank you. Thank you. Will? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want Will got a haircut too? I did. Spring is on. All these men are getting <laughs> on the haircut. Well, really oh, nice nice sure. Good morning. I'll tell you brief because I testified. You did. We're, uh, we're at the point, I think, where we're either going to do something with this bill or not. 
Yeah. Um, well, there was. <laughs> so, I wasn't sure we had fully gotten it. No, that's what I want to. I want to make sure that everybody has their chance to weigh in on it, and then we'll have the committee discussion and decide what we want to do. Well, setting director of elections for the record, really briefly to just reiterate what I said last time, we do support this bill in its current form um, as a good first step. That was how I let off last time, Hi. so I want to reiterate that. And to Mr. Is it Merkin yeah. as well. Um, so we honestly, my office shares this concern that we think we could do more in terms of um, figuring out who should and should not have access to the bill. What I want to make clear to the committee and to everybody who's commented is that this bill is, really has a pretty limited scope. Mm -hmm. It speaks to the federal government, right, or a foreign government or its agencies. And those are the people to whom those purposes apply that Mr. Merkin was, was referencing. So anybody who is not the federal government can still request this checklist with this bill passed for any other purpose mm -hmm. besides a commercial one because they're not the federal government using it for one of those purposes. And, it, and the, the, the current existing restriction on commercial purposes stays, but that's it. And that's what your current law is. Anybody can have it if they'll sign the affidavit not using it for a commercial purpose. Mm -hmm. That remains the case for everyone requesting the checklist right. except the federal government right. under this bill. Right. And that's so. why we support it as limited in scope. Um, the initial concepts we were throwing around in the House committee um, just to, to put it in your head because it's been discussed were ideas um, for instance limiting it the access to the checklist to candidates PACs and parties for campaign related purposes either voter registration voter outreach walking walking lists etc that is the approach taken by a significant number of the states when we're thinking about this going forward not in the context of this bill but maybe next year Betsy can provide you with a really nice um, summary of what the other states do, put together by NCSL. That's pretty common, a, a restriction that only allows campaign-related purposes to campaign-related entities. One of the ones that sort of seems like um, is variable between states and that we thought about and is hard to define, I think, is the concept of also letting researchers, academic researchers, have access to the checklist who, who do request it fairly often. Um, but that's all... I think to be considered in a, another bill in the next session, hopefully in my standard every two year elections cleanup bill. Um, and we see this bill as a good first small step, admittedly um, targeted toward the kind of request like we got this summer from the Presidential Commission. Is there anything in, the, if we were to pass this language, that would permit the Secretary of State from sharing the list with the federal government? Or would, the, would your office also be banned from delivering it to the federal government? We would be banned under the provisions in here. <clears throat> so, you know, if President Obama had formed a commission to enhance voter participation and tried to work with secretaries of state to, you know, gather data to do a national survey of voters, and we have this, and all of a sudden, we, you know, we like that mission, and so then you've got to come and kind of change the law so that we can comply with the, that, that, right? I mean, I, the, this is where I just get uncomfortable. We're, we're not... Well, under your see, yeah, exact that hypothetical, I would say we could because it's not one of the restricted purposes. But, so it's, but it's the federal government was doing it. Let's say. Well, but that's why purpose, those purposes uh, are in there. It's not just a blanket purpose. prohibition so, on the federal government. Right. The federal government can't use them for these three specific purposes. That was sort of, I think, specifically the concern of the AG's office in some prior drafts was sort of to not restrict a legitimate use by the federal government. So what is number that. A under the purpose? Registration of a voter based on his or her information maintained in the election. But registration of what? It's not entirely as clearly worded as I would have liked it, but that's the concept of creating a registry, a new registry of a oh, certain class. Oh, when we were talking about the Muslim registry. Yeah. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah. Because it says for the purpose of registration of a voter, and I think that if you would have been prohibited from giving it, if if the purpose for Obama it asking says of for a voter, it, does it? registration of a yeah. voter. Okay. If he had, if there would if the commission had said we're going to try and increase voter registration, 
that sounds like it would have been pretty good. Yeah, although I mean, we, we, it's a hypothetical, but we have parsed yeah. down to probably the ultimate yeah. registration would still happen by the town clerk. It would be some kind of outreach to say, go get registered. So how, my question is, how important is this to do right now as opposed to really looking at it comprehensively in January? I guess that's my question. If, if we're going to look bit by bit, or if we look comprehensively at who should have access? I think it's a fair, good question, but I do think the secretary would support having this in place while we have that yeah. longer discussion. Okay. Anybody else? Brandon, did you want to weigh in? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I wait, wait, before we close, oh, I just sorry. had something else. Sorry. You had, the last time we had this conversation, thought we had talked about having a D, a fourth thing, which was giving the Secretary of State broader discretion. Do you remember that? Yes. Do you have language? No. I spoke with Ledge Council this morning. You may want to hear her weigh in on that. Uh, for the record, Brandon Batham, political director of the Democratic Party. Again, like Will, we don't really have much to add from what Connor Casey uh, shared with you all last week. Um, you know, the way that this bill is written, it would have minimal to no effect on on the, our party operations. We, I think, as Connor may have mentioned, we don't receive phone numbers uh, from uh, from the statewide voter checklist. Uh, it's just not what we get that information. So uh, it really would not have much of an effect on us. Um, in terms of you know future iterations of similar restrictions, uh, you know I'd, I'd be hesitant to say let's use this as a you know as a small step to the next thing. I think there are very different priorities between the Secretary of State's office and the Vermont Democratic Party. But um, yeah, it, as it's written right now, it would not uh, it would not affect us. For the record, Joshua Donovan, Deputy Attorney General. Um, the Attorney General's Office supports H 624 in its current form uh, as a um, effectuating a, an important policy objective, which is protecting the privacy interests of Vermonters, which is a long standing tradition in this state. And as I understand it, this bill came out of the historic context, which I'm sure you're all aware of, of the Presidential Commission right. on Voter Integrity. Yeah and as a way to address those concerns. Our office got a number of calls raising the concern that very sensitive personal information might be shared with the federal government for questionable purposes, and uh, we think this is a reasonable measure to address those concerns. It is interesting that um, we, I mean, in the telephone book, I know people don't, have landlines anymore, but yes, in a telephone book, you can look up everybody's address and telephone numbers. And right, it, it's They're right on the grand list. Right, or on the grand list. But uh, it, it, it's it's just a very interesting how we think about privacy and I mean, and I do I do understand. And, and if I may, the Attorney General's office is also looking at this on the commercial side of things as well. Uh, we're supporting a bill dealing with data brokers that would collect say. this type of information uh, from various sources and then sell it to others, sometimes for good purposes, sometimes not for good purposes, and, and starting to get a handle on that so that people can have a sense of security in their identities is, a, I think, an important issue for the legislature to consider. Mm -hmm. Thank you. time you met about a potential D um, in addition to those three stated purposes now for which the federal government or foreign government could be denied access to the statewide voter checklist. And I'll just reiterate what I think I addressed last time is that when the General Assembly delegates authority to another entity, 
there has to be specified standards by which that entity will exercise that authority so that the General Assembly still has control over the state policy. So I don't think it could be an open-ended um, open-ended power for the Secretary of State to determine, and in any other cases, um, the Secretary thinks advisable, for example. I think there needs to be some articulated standards uh, under which the Secretary of State would exercise um, an option D. So perhaps the one thing that just came to mind was anything substantially similar to A through C, which probably is not really helpful, but you have to articulate how the, how the Secretary of State would exercise this decision-making authority to reject a request for the checklist by the federal government. That's all I really had to say on that. Other questions? Any questions for Betsy? Yeah, um, I have a question on enforcement. What are our enforcement measures on this? And we talked about it, uh, and I can't, I mean, I'm just curious what our enforcement measures are. In, um, on page three, we talked about enforcement under B, C, B, C, 1, B. Mm -hmm. So what's, you know, what happens if you do? What's the enforcement? Well, that is that if somebody wants to obtain a copy of the checklist, they have to swear or affirm under the penalties of perjury that they won't uh, give the checklist to the federal government or a foreign government in circumvention of the prohibitions, you know, the right. three reasons why it can't be used. Um, penalty for perjury, I always have to refer back to that so language. 10, 000. 10 or 15, something like that. And a potential imprisonment as well. Yeah, it's pretty high. 10,000 15 years. Yeah. Thank you. And, and it would be, I believe it's been discussed before, complaint driven. Um, a complaint would have to be made. Um, and then. Um, yes, it probably would not be self reported. They would not be self reported. I'm pulling up the perjury statute. It's yes, 15 years and $10,000 fine or both. I'm, I'm just curious uh, if we have incidences of uh, major concern about. Where the checklist has gone, other than our most recent one with the presidential commission. Well, so now it's under current law. Now that the checklist can't be used for commercial purposes, if a person wants to obtain a copy of the statewide voter checklist, they currently have to fill out um, right, this, that. This. So, if we have any instance as well of, uh, of no, no formal enforcement action taken. So you haven't had any formal. And you're right. It's a, it's a difficult thing. Yeah, no, I'm just curious. I always it's hard to do things and not have real ways to enforce it. So, um, yeah, I think how it would play out now if it were to would be that my office would somehow become aware of an entity using it for a commercial purpose that had signed the affidavit to us, and we would register a complaint with the agency. here with our big data, our data broker bill is interesting because, you know, we have no notion really if these are being sold. Uh, I mean, if bought and promised they're not being but used. I mean, it's just, we don't really have any clue. If there's, I can do a small Google investigation. Really? Do we put little tags on, like, we could put a tag on my name and see where it goes in the dark magic of the internet. Mm -hmm. The dark web. Dark oh, I, I, oh, my name is sadly all sorts of places. I, I know, I'm like, I've just, uh, but they won't find. I unfortunately think we are so far past any protection of privacy at all that, I mean, every everybody who wants to can know where every one of us is right now if we have a cell phone. You know, oh, I've turned and where off. we're going I've and where we're tracking off. Uh, I don't think you can turn your <laughs> tracking off. I think I think that is a 
is a try to. Uh, That's a myth. It's a uh, what do you call it? Placebo a placebo pill. Yes. It's a, it's a, and and they we have gone so far beyond any any idea of privacy I agree. that. Um, but you're not implying that we should just give up, right? No, I'm not implying that we should just give up. I'm just. Well, I mean, they'll, they'll think of more ways to find us if we do. If yeah, we, yeah, but I, I think that, that we it's should. our idea of privacy has become an illusion. Maybe it needs re identification. Hmm? Maybe it needs re identification. What's that? It compiles information from everywhere criminal records, on with records, me? addresses. Anybody. All of us. And it, it takes about four minutes for it to go through its cycle and cool. get a full profile. Is that Cambridge Analytica? <laughs> my life. Oh, my life. Oh, my it's oh. chilling. Oh my gosh, you don't even need to go to Cambridge Analytica to be chilled. No. 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 My life, though. Yeah. Anyway, it, I mean, I ordered one thing online one time. Oh, you did? I did. I Sorry, Chris. I'm moving out. I, <laughs> I ordered a CD that I couldn't get anywhere else. Right? Yeah. And for, for years, I got things that say, if you like this CD, you might like this CD. Yeah. That's right. That's big data at work. It is big data at work. Anyway. So my apologies for being late. I'm not sure I had a, another meeting. Yeah, I figured so where are we? So we are trying to figure out what to do with H624. The Secretary of State would like us to pass it. Um, we are deciding whether it's important to um, pass it now or not pass it and have a real in-depth look at, I think that's what we're trying to figure out, or put it off and have a real in-depth look at who actually should have access over the next year. Why can't we do both? I, well, I suppose we could. Do you have some suggestions about, then we'll, we can continue to take testimony on who should have access. Oh, you yeah. oh. Well, I don't know about who should one. have access, but I understood this bill to um, authorize the Secretary of State not to share our with the federal information right. with the right. federal government. Right, so, so. The, the larger question is, who should we actually determine who should have access to it instead of who shouldn't have access and the who shouldn't would just be the federal government and commercial. We like the way That's Betsy reframed it positively in our last discussion of this report. Well, I, well don't, I don't see why they have to be done at the same time if we're worried about not getting anything. No, that, that's the justice is the question. Okay, I'm sorry. The Secretary of State wants us to do it now. Um, yes, Will. Just one comment on that exact point, and I know you, you understand this, but it's worth saying again, that the reason that he wants it so, that he supports it so much is because of the amount of calls that we got from Vermonters over the summer and fall who said, I don't want the federal government to right. He's not just doing it out of the blue or out of spite. No, we, we, we realize federal that, government. and we realize that there are ways of circumventing this, and that if the federal government really wants it, they will get it. Well, they tried, and they didn't. I mean, if they really wanted it, I mean, they, they backed off, and they that did, commission has been dissolved. No, it's been turned over to Homeland Security. Oh, I heard it was oh. dissolved. It too. was dissolved, but the... the uh, Response to the duties have been turned over to Homeland Security, and if they really want it, they they're going to get it. We but we can, I, I'm happy enough to. They've already got it. Huh? They've already. Got it. I, I'm sure they probably. They have do. yours. They, yeah, they, we they gave them yours. We needed a letter. I'm happy. System. I'm happy to pass <laughs> this now and and hope it does something. Hope it does something, or at least puts people's minds at ease a little bit. Which is probably okay. the okay. one thing that it will Just do. Just don't knock over the fruit. Okay. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. I was it up to Alice now to hold up her fluff jar. Sorry. I would add, I think the Attorney General is important Alice. in this too, that if the commission hadn't been disbanded, if they continued to press us for our checklist and had taken us to court, if, if Secretary Tonda said we would continue to review, the yes. federal government had sued us to get the checklist, we would be in a much better legal standing with this bill. Right. 
I, I, I think that is probably true. If I were this federal government and I wanted it, I wouldn't do it that way. I would find a much more devious way to do it than to actually file a charge against the state of Vermont. But okay. I like the idea of you being devious in technology. <laughs> no, not in technology. Yes, that's what I'm saying. No, it wouldn't. Oh, right. uh -huh. Anyway, I okay, okay anyway, are okay. we? If we're ready, I'm ready to move. H624. Betsy? Unamended. Um, there was one potential cleanup, I believe, that we oh. discussed last time on the bill as passed the House. If you look starting at page three in regard to the Public Records Act and what is considered exempt, mm -hmm. and you're looking at C31, and it describes this protected voter info, mm -hmm. and you turn over to the very last page, and it says, contained in an application to the right. statewide voter checklist. And I believe we discussed with the Secretary of State's office that it seems like that is really supposed to be saying contained in a voter registration application or the statewide voter checklist. Um, is that Karen Richards' concern? Because I realized we forgot to address this for I believe I believe that's something the Director of Elections brought up or that we discussed is scenario. what does it mean? We don't. Nobody applies to the statewide voter checklist. They right. apply to register to vote in a voter registration application. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's really just a clean up. I don't know if it needs to happen. You don't apply to the statewide checklist. That's all. You you apply to your towns. You apply, and that's what Karen Richards, I think, heard. No, hers no. was on page the top of page. Um, we'll see, clean this one up first. Okay, Go yeah. To that. So what would we need to do to clean this up? Contained in an application to the municipal check voter checklist. You yeah, would say contained in a voter registration application or the statewide voter checklist. Does that make sense? Yeah. Contained in a voter, okay, you're going to do it. See, I don't so know then Karen, where this thing is that you're fixing. It's in section two, like well, the very, yeah. And then the Karen page. Richards had one. It's on the top of page three. Did you get that? No, I didn't see that. C1. Sure. And it says any person wishing to obtain a copy of the statewide voter checklist oh. or a, of a municipality portion of the statewide voter checklist. Add that on line two in, on page three. Oh the top of page three on C1. Perhaps the director of elections wanna, wants to weigh in. I, I think that was discussed on the House side, with, but Maybe isn't C the issue being, so she is requesting that it be in C1. Yes. Isn't that issue then that every time a person wants to get go to right to the town clerk they're going to have to start filling out the affidavit. Yeah. Isn't that an issue oh, that that's was discussed why we don't on the house side? That? Yes, and the clerks agree. Oh, okay. They do not want to have people fill out an affidavit every time they... Okay. And that's what Karen is asking people to have to do is fill out? No, she does not want that. No, she doesn't. This is from process. February 12th, so she has changed okay. her mind. I, I talked to Karen this morning. Yeah. They're happy with the bill as it is. Okay, okay. So sorry, we did but, not have a... Didn't know that this had been done. And they are because the, again, the overlying protection, the towns yeah. don't have to go to the feds either. Yeah. All right. Okay. So can we make that little change? Yes. And then Very easy. Is there any possibility we can just vote on that today? I can definitely do that um, okay. at the end of the day today. It'll be short. Okay. So. It's a kind of. What, <laughs> what we want to do now is hear. Uh, the secretary, the attorney general's campaign finance report. We all got copies of it. We have it here. We do. Oh okay. yes. Does the committee have an extra copy? Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Did you post this? Nope. Uh, the report. The, my staff was supposed to email it to you. No, I know, but it's a report, so you're supposed to post it under reports. I don't. She. Okay. okay. No. Is there by chance an extra paper copy? You can use mine. Oh no, I can take yours. If it's posted online too, I can find it on. No, it's not.
Okay. Here, we'll share. No number. Chris and I'll share. You take sure? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just for point of clarification, posting to our website or to your community? To the, to the, anytime there's a report that goes to a, um, to the General Assembly or a committee, it gets posted on the legislative, legislative uh, website reports place. Reports. But then Gail posts it to our committee webpage. They can't post to our webpage. Right. I think that's and there's, um, if, if the AG's office wants to go on to the legislative website, there's instructions on there on how to do that. Okay. Well, I do that right now. Oh, man. TJ, Joshua, Bill. Any, anything that comes in here like that is public record. Yeah, okay. Thanks. So would you like to tell us about this report? Madam Chair, I'd be happy to do so. Okay. Um, we will acknowledge that we have it on April 4th. Excuse me. April 4th, just in time. Just in time for the session to end. And I it's irresistible. You know we can't help ourselves. Have read this. You need to look more contrite. Very carefully okay. and have lots of red time. All right. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank Joshua Diamond, Deputy Attorney General. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk to you all about the uh, campaign, the Committee on Campaign Finance Education, Compliance and Reform and the report that they have published with regards to their efforts. Um, if I may, just by giving a historical context and, and frame this report, in 2017, uh, the Secretary of State's office and the Attorney General's office established this committee uh, for the purpose of soliciting ideas, input, and concerns about Vermont's campaign finance laws. Um, and, and hopefully to uh, bring about potential solutions and reforms to improve the operation, transparency, and effectiveness of our campaign finance system. And so uh, the committee has a pretty broad membership it sought membership from uh, all the political parties in the state of Vermont, the major political parties. Um, and I want to give a special thanks to Jacob Perkinson, who uh, chaired this committee in his efforts to uh, convene and organize and guide discussion. Uh, other folks that I'd like to just give a quick shout out and recognition, uh, Brady Tenzing from the uh, Vermont Republican Party, Josh Ronsky, uh, Executive De Director from the Vermont Progressive Party, uh, Liz Blum, Windsor County Chair of the Progressive Party, uh, Madeline Mata, Chair of the Vermont Ethics Commission, and then the staff of the Secretary of State's Office and the Attorney General's Office. There were five public hearings that uh, took place across Vermont, ranging from Montpelier to uh, Bennington, Hartford, Rutland, and Winooski. And there were, uh, these hearings uh, were well attended, uh, and similar themes came up uh, throughout those uh, hearings. And we tried to uh, collate those in the report. They're found at page two. And some of those uh, themes that we heard from were uh, the issue about penalties, that there were complaints about uh, candidates who, um, maybe not intentionally, uh, but were um, negligently not filing their reports or not doing it in a timely way. And as uh, we've come to learn that it's the publication of information, the disclosure of activities, which is so important to current campaign finance enforcement. And so could we create uh, a better penalty structure to address that concern? There were concerns raised about the dollar value of contribution limits, in particular in municipal elections, that currently under Vermont law, there's a $1,000 per election contribution limit for municipal elections. And um, as you can imagine, in some small communities, for a school board race or a select board race, a few thousand dollar contributions can really uh, impact those election cycles. There was a discussion about uh, a desire for an independent ombuds to handle uh, campaign finance complaints, um, a desire for uh, additional disclosures, financial disclosures, so uh, more fre frequent reporting, um, there were calls for moving the primary date uh, off of August uh, to increase voter participation, although as I understand it, that may be constrained by federal law. Uh, 
there was a desire for more clarity on the revolving door limits, uh, conflict of interest rules, uh, and things of that nature, which I believe the legislature addressed uh, to some degree in its uh, establishment of the Ethics Committee or the uh, Ethics Commission last Well, this is, this is somewhat separate. The financial disclosure? Yeah, and they I, I missed there. I was trying to figure out, I was trying to get this copy to, to Allison and I. It's, uh, the printer is taking forever to print it. I don't know why. But. No worries, Madam Chair. Uh, so somewhat different. So I was talking about the desire from an ombuds yeah. who could be an independent source for the investigation of campaign finance complaints. But separate and apart from that, uh, folks at these hearings raised concern about a desire for more clarity, both on um, financial reporting of campaign activities um, as well as moving the primary date from August, uh, probably to September, to inspire more voter turnout. Uh, the concern, I think, was that folks were on vacation in August. Uh, but as I understand it, and uh, maybe the representative from the Secretary of State's office can speak to this, there are federal laws that are requiring that, that compliance. Do you know why, what they meant by more frequent reporting? We report every other day right now. <laughs> That's ridiculous. So I was not there for all of these hearings, um, but, uh, and I'm not trying to convey the validity of the comments, but just uh, sharing with you the concerns that we heard. But, there, but we don't know if they meant that local candidates should do more often. I mean, there's not, okay. I think it was a broad right. okay. um, desire for more reporting. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair. Yes. Yes. It, it, you know, under enforcement, you said that this came up at every meeting. There should be penalties. But at these others, I have no idea how often they came up. Did one person say we should re, we should report re, report more often? And I want to know where he lives. <laughs> Did they? <laughs> so so uh, oh. I I don't have at, at the top of my head or my fingertips oh. the the granularity of that okay. data. I, right. If that's of interest, I could see whether we could go back and take a look at the minutes um, and the not notes. <laughs> no. So can I? I know you have the next three items on, under that bullet under financial disclosure. Yes. I don't understand what they have to do with campaign finance. At all, mm -hmm. I, I agree. Um, but those were issues that came up um, more than once at these um, at these hearings, and so we're just sharing the input that the public was providing uh, at these hearings. Okay, with you but it, that really has nothing to do with campaign finance, nor does the term mm -hmm. limits. Mm -hmm. Correct. No. Okay. Correct. Um, and then uh, I believe there were questions. Uh, about whether the contributions to a county committee should count as a contribution to the state committee. Um, the issue of public financing of elections uh, was raised at these uh, hearings. Um, the equity, the ability for publicly financed candidates to uh, equitably participate in the electoral process, uh, access to funds, the start date is a problem as well, February 15th, that if if you declare as a candidate before February 15th, you're exempt under the current statute from participating in the public financing, and that puts those who wish to participate in public financing at a disadvantage. And then, while not directly related to campaign finance, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, another issue that was raised, which was um, the governor's two-year term, uh, and that uh, it would be more important to have our executive officials governing and instead of running for office and therefore uh, a desire for a four-year term for the governor. Which also has nothing to do with campaign finance. But. Huh? Yeah. But. but we thought it was important to reflect the common comments that were generated during these sessions. So. After those public hearings, the committee uh, went to work on a number of, met on a number of occasions uh, to talk about, well, what might be some practical solutions to these issues? And not just the issues raised by those, but by the practitioners and those experienced in campaign, uh, running campaigns. And um, a series of 
I guess, subject areas were identified for, for work and solution. And I'm going to lump these um, into two different categories, uh, one being what we would consider practical amendments to the existing campaign finance statute, and then more um, structural, larger. Uh, and they may not have been laid out in, in as logical order uh, in the report, but I'll, I'm going to edit a little bit for purposes of my comments. Uh, first of all, the definition of a candidate committee. Under current law, it is arguably narrowly defined for purposes of the candidate and their staff. And the concern was in this um, environment of coordinated contributions, expenditures, which we've seen as a potential problem. There have been several cases through the AG's office over the years addressing this. Uh, should that be expanded to a more uh, broader definition consistent with agency concepts. And as the committee began to dive into that, what the committee realized is that while a good idea, there could be complications because there's been case law that's developed under the current definitions and how um, coordinated contributions and expenditures operate. And so before we start tinkering with definitions, we got to make sure there aren't collateral consequences. And we just, the committee didn't, wasn't able to finish its work and come up with a, uh, a concrete suggestion, but it's an issue uh, that they can hope to continue to work on. Uh, the definition of election electronic communications, um, or excuse me, I, uh, electioneering communications, I should say. Um, as you all know, uh, elect ele election communications, sorry, uh, requires a disclaimer about who funded that communication and their address. Um, in this era of new technologies on how we communicate, we just wanted to make sure that that definition is as broad enough as it is to capture new forms of social media that may not have existed when the definition was first created. Um, exclusions from the definition of, uh, of a contribution. Uh, one thing folks identified was that the current statute is sometimes difficult to digest unless you're a lawyer practicing in this area, and if we could reorganize those exclusions in a more digestible way that might help enforcement, uh, as well as some folks raise concerns that the parties under current law can contribute in unlimited amounts to the candidates that doesn't violate, to put a restriction might violate the First Amendment. And so do you really need exclusions from party activity? I, I don't want to speak for the parties, but I, if I was channeling their argument, they might say there, there could be reporting um, complications if we had to mark every little thing and identify every little thing that's done for a candidate. So that those tensions uh, hadn't yet been harmonized to provide yet a, a practical solution, but again, something that the committee hopes to be working on. Uh, liquidated penalties for delayed filings. So going back to that issue about complaints about folks who might not report or do on a timely basis, a suggestion was... I'm sure. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Did you say liquidated something? That liquidated what, what damage. What does that mean? So um, my apologies, and that's my editorial editorializing. In contracts, you might see uh, a place where um, if someone breaches, the contract provides for a damage or a penalty without, in a circumstance where you can't clearly see what that penalty or damage might be. So if someone breaches your contract, you can't measure that clearly. So to create an incentive for compliance with that contract, you create a liquidated, a set amount for a violation, a dollar per day. And so that exists already for lobbyists. If lobbyists fail to report on their timely reporting requirements, it's $25 a day as a way to motivate compliance. So the thought was not to use a heavy hammer, but maybe create some incentive for uh, those candidates who might absentmindedly forget to report because they only got a few hundred dollars in contributions to make timely comp uh, filings. And the thought was a $25 per day amount. Um, contribution limits. Like, I mean, one of the biggest challenges is there, there are like no tick workers. There's nobody well, reminding you. Yes, well, you get a, you, Oh, we get what at do least you two emails from you, the secretary. You get, I guess you do, and then they go to you get a well. You get a I reminder. I get them and my treasurer. Yeah. I get yeah, a reminder. That's right. There you go. That's new. 
But that's, that, that's, is that new in the last couple of years? What's that? The ticklers, the reminders to file? We do not oh. send reminders to file. I get a reminder to file. I do. It may be the first thing I think you do. Yeah. We, Maybe not. we, do. I can only speak to what the parties do. We do send out from time to time reminders to to candidates or local committees that have raised funds. But helpful. I think it comes from the from the Secretary of State's office. If, if there, I get a thing and it says your campaign finance report is due, and it says a date. And then and when I file it, I get a thing sorry. that says you have filed your campaign. You certainly get that. I, I'm going to check on what. I think I get more than one. I, yeah. But let's clarify that because either the party or somebody, because I am now remembering it. Sorry. No worries. Good questions. Um, <clears throat> contribution limits. The committee discussed whether it would be possible to limit uh, contribution limits in municipal elections, bring down that number from 1000 maybe to something like $500. Um, as you all probably know, um, the only justifiable explanation for contribution limits under the First Amendment is to address quid pro quo corruption or the appearance thereof. And so um, $1,000, uh, we've looked at some case law uh, since the Randell decision uh, that was here in the state of Vermont that uh, addressed contribution limits. There's only been a few dealing with limits below $1,000. And the law does seem to be mixed, so there may be some authority to support it. Uh, the law goes in both directions. Did they talk about the difference between a local race in Halifax and in Burlington? No, the cases, um, and forgive me, my memory may escape so the me. The cases are in Alaska and Montana. Yeah. But I just wondered if when they talked about lowering this limit, if, if they talked about what it costs to run a local race in Halifax as opposed to what it costs to run a local race in Burlington. In, it's, and so just drawing that analogy to the specific states, let's say Anchorage versus um, Nome, Alaska, there, there wasn't that kind of discussion in those cases. Um, no, I meant the committee. Oh, the committee. The cases. No, the committee. no, the committee didn't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Surplus campaign fund, uh, finance funds. So, sir, did, did you just skip civil investigation because I wasn't? So I'm look. I'm going to talk about yes. that yeah, in, in a minute. Okay. Um, the ombuds role. Sorry, surplus. Surplus, surplus campaign finance funds. Um, there was a concern raised uh, by the the committee that it is possible under the current law that someone who has run statewide campaigns and got the four thousand dollar limits could amass a war chest and they don't spend everything and then decide they want to run for a local election, maybe the House of Representatives, the Senate, and have all this money that they obtained from $4,000 contributions and does that give them an unfair advantage in the local elections and was, was there language to address that? And then um, finally, uh, campaign... Sorry. Yes, I have to ask. Are there any uh, examples? There are two in the Senate. Anthony and Galbraith. Did Galbraith ever actually run? For a lower office. Yeah. For a no, lower for a lower office. Statewide. But we're no. talking lower office. Senator, Senator Bray as well. That's right. Bray. But, but you're talking about going for a no. lower office where we're the talking about limits lower. are lower. That, that is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Galbraith, Galbraith either was nominated or... I mean, right. after being a senator. He was toying with that. Peter Galbraith was the nominee. Was considering nomination, but he he never he didn't raise any money. He never ran for a number of offices. But do we? But, so but he didn't switch switch the switch the money. But that is a oh might. yeah oh I see what you mean yeah. If I if I could, yeah. I, I think a, probably a, a very concrete example would be Senator Bray, who ran as a House member in 2010 for uh, in the primary for lieutenant governor, then went on to run uh, for the Senate the following cycle. Uh, you know, did he roll over? Yeah. yeah, that's an example. And pulling out the Yeah. An example yeah. of whether he did it or not. Oh, uh, yes. yeah. Okay. Yeah. We ran out of them. I don't yeah. know yeah. anything about the yeah. I, I think the potential yeah. is there yeah. Yeah. more than. Yeah, that's a good yeah. 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 I haven't even thought about it. Done for some of the back in the day. 
Oh, yeah. Two? Yeah. Sorry, which one? Receive. Yeah, receive. Receive. I'll receive. Right. And then um, there was a discussion about creator, creating greater transparency on the source of funds from contributors who are not natural persons, something I know that this committee has taken up uh, in legislation nice. this year. Mm -hmm. So as far as some of the structural areas that we think are worth discussion or worth further consideration and work um, is the creation of an ombuds, uh, an independent position. Uh, the discussion was within the, the current State Ethics Commission to oversee campaign finance compliance. Um, my understanding is that uh, 48 states in the United States have a State Ethics Commission. A fourth of those uh, handle campaign finance through their operations. And then another 11 states have independent administrative entities um, similar or analogous to the FEC that might address those issues. And the purpose would be to educate, uh, issue advisory opinions, and investigate violations of campaign finance uh, with some degree of administrative enforcement authority. Um, certainly funding would be an issue that would have to be worked out. Another structural issue that was identified was how do we, how do we address uh, valuation of emails and contact lists? I think there have been um, cases involving these questions. Um, there's probably some, the committee recognized there are value to these lists, but how to value them in a way that provides some bright lines so that people aren't guessing would be very helpful and uh, the committee believes further time should be spent uh, trying to come up with a solution to that uh, public policy problem. And then um, public financing. Um, while not unanimously supported by all the committee members, I think there was certainly a majority of folks who felt that um, work is needed on public financing and need for reform uh, to support the effectiveness of public financing in our electoral process. There's a lack of funding um, and there's underfunding is part of the problem. Um, the relationship of those who are publicly financed and belong to a major political party and how they might get assistance under current law, uh, unless it does fall into one of the named contribution exclusions, those would be considered in-kind contributions and potentially could exempt someone from participating in public financing. Uh, the issue of underutilization, if we're trying to level the playing field, if you will, through encouraging folks to participate, how do we get folks uh, to participate and expand to other elections should it just be limited to the top two uh, executive offices in the state of Vermont. As I'm sure you all can appreciate having worked with these issues over the years, these are extremely complicated questions uh, of public policy, of law. Um, the committee um, will continue its efforts to uh, try to provide some solutions to the issues that we have addressed in this report in hopes of providing uh, more concrete proposals to the legislature in the next planning. It um, struck me that when I was reading this that, um, and I think some of these suggestions and areas for further study are, are great, like the public financing and the value of emails and that kind of stuff. But it, it struck me on here that the only two people on this list, as far as I know, that have ever run for anything are TJ and Condos. And it might be interesting to have More. a couple people on the committee who actually have had, I mean, somebody from a, a, a maybe Chittenden County, where it, it was, it's very different than a race in Essex or Leeds. I, I mean, just have a couple people on here who have actually been a candidate. Well, Liz Blum, in all fairness, I, I don't know who she is. And I do. She's Windsor County. She uh, has run for the select board in Norwich, right? And maybe even more to it. Yeah, and more than that. So maybe. Liz has been right. a candidate. Okay. But she's the only other person I know here who has. Madam Chair, it's a fair it's critique, big. although if, if I may say, a lot of the members, if they haven't been candidates themselves, have been very active in the political process of I running elections. That. Uh, so I think there was a broad array of expertise that was brought yeah. to the to the committee. I, I get that. It just there. Um, 
it's very different to be a candidate than to be. It sure is. I mean, it, 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 it's very different in how you look at these issues. It's very different. It was chair so I just. Yeah, and I, I think to maybe extrapolate on some of the, certainly two members there who probably have a very in-depth understanding of campaign finance rules, Jake Parkinson, the chair, was the chair of the Vermont Democratic Party for mm -hmm. some time. Brady Tonesing, for everything we could say about him as vice chair of the Republican Party, knows a great deal about the law and, um, and, and campaign finance uh, regulations. He tries to swat us at every chance he gets. So, you know, we certainly, there, there, is a, there, there is a very thorough understanding of practically how this works and, and uh, on, that, on that committee. Madeline Mata, an, another example of somebody who's, uh, who's got us. No. I, I'm, it was just a suggestion that I think that, that having a real understanding of the campaign finance laws and live under them. is very different than actually being a candidate and having to figure out how to, how to do them and how to, it was just a suggestion. Because when we, it took us, as you know, six, eight years to do our campaign finance law after it was struck down by the Supreme Court. Yeah. And two or three there, vetoes, I think. Yeah, and there yeah. are 180 people here who all had to live under those laws, and there was a, a lot of variation of how they were applied and how they were, what they meant in their areas and everything. So it was just a su suggestion. But yeah. I would hope, actually, you would make some pretty bold recommendations. I mean, and uh, really try and, I mean, I would look forward to you actually putting, a, a, you know, a really bold suggestion on public financing, because I think I think either we all do it, or it's it's never going to be a level playing field. So I would be thrilled if you came back to the legislature and said we actually recommend that everyone with Maine functions on a public financing system, and we're going to fund it. And wouldn't you know? Wouldn't that be fabulous to take? If we really believe that we should take money out of this. Uh, let's then let's then actually put our money where our mouth is, uh, and and establish what that would cost, and really uh, advocate for it. So is that it? it all candidates use the main yeah. well, House and the Senate. They don't have to. They, no, they, oh, they have. To. I don't know. Oh. It's fair to say they all do, but they have very and Connecticut. They have very uh, strong. Voluntary yeah, use I remember that did, but I just didn't know who could use it for some reason. I thought it was state. Oh, it's very liberating. Yeah, actually, yeah, focus on policy. So I think I think the major issue with public financing is coming up with the money for it. I think that that I don't. Well, there probably are very few people around who would. Um, Bill Doyle tried his best to get us to adopt. Main system of public financing. Did he? Yes. Yeah. He, he was moved. a big supporter. He's, he was. He, we talked to people in Maine so much that I can't. I, we, anyway, he. So there are a lot of people who support it. The problem is coming up with the money. And well, I noticed that you said here fees paid by the candidates, and I don't think that would probably be constitutional, and certainly not welcome. Yeah, particularly given how frequently we have to do it. But also, I would hope that, as a former Ways and Means member, I would hope that you not only come up with a bold suggestion, but come up with a way to finance it. It's not enough to say we should do it. Yeah. That would be we good. need to find out what yeah. it costs yeah. and how we're going to pay for it. So, and get the governor on board while you're at it. So, <coughs> any more questions about this this report? Well, Glad we could find this. It's good to finally read it. I would be I would be happy to see a little more aggression on that part of public financing. Mm -hmm. Well, it's Bill's getting a little right crazy. Yeah. I, I, I think it might be helpful to have it come from outside the legislature. Yeah, I agree. And the and the yeah. legislature exactly. to be able to respond to the public yeah. outcry. Instead of us trying to yes. yeah. and instead yeah. of our assuming that the public would have an outcry. I think the public are now very well educated about what money means in this system. And they are sadly being ruled by white cats and not. And so I, 
I think that actually the public has never been better educated and poised to actually look at this in the way it thought. Right. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Josh, going out. All right, we are going to move to something else. Disclosures in campaign finance law. Yes. yes. An afternoon. We tried to put these in the same day so that the same people <laughs> sit here with us all day. Same cast of characters. I look for that note I passed. <laughs> yes. It is snowing outside, everybody. Yep. So, let me make sure, Betsy, S44 did get put into law. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Series standard. I just wanted to make absolutely certain. Okay. So, um, we have had some testimony on this. We were going to... Um, Try to, is this the one where you're going to have to put Facebook. all your print on Facebook? Yep. All your print? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Paid for by text based. Oh, on uh, Facebook ads. That's a bad idea. It's never going to fit. I mean, again, you have to be a candidate to it. Well, we're not debating. Figure it out. You're <laughs> Sorry. Is that well, bad? Would you like to say to us about this? No, I don't think you have. We heard from Brandon and Josh and Betsy, and I think that was it. Oh, sure. Oh, and Eleanor. I beat her. I keep getting all these election scores and stuff. Why don't we just have one? Will sending director of elections for the record. I can keep this one brief too, in that um, my office supports this bill in its current form. I forget the number right now. 828. 828. Um, it was not the brainchild of our office, it came from one of the House committee members, um, but we support it. I support it because, in my mind, under current law, and this Senator Clarkson, I want to make sure is clear. Um, you're right now required to put paid for by language on Facebook ads. Okay. The point of this bill, as I understand it, and from the committee, was to make that easier, in fact. Right. Um, by allowing a person to put a link or something akin to a link on the ad instead of the full paid for by language that would take you to the paid for by language. That was the concept in my understanding of the bill and reading of the bill. It also clarifies that this kind of activity is an electioneering communication. Although, again, in my mind, it, reading the current law, that's what I would tell a candidate who asked me. Um, but it makes that clear, I think, that, and that's a positive um, step forward in this bill. However, I guess when I, I, was, I wasn't sick, or I wasn't here because I was sick, there were concerns raised about actually how some of the inner workings of Facebook work that I'm not familiar with, in all honesty. I have never been on Facebook. What? <laughs> you may be the only person in <laughs> don't know much about no, how it works. I've never been on Facebook. I've tried to do it during my last campaign, and I promised everybody that I would post, and I did it three times, I think, and then I forgot about it. So I have probably all these things there. Wow. If it's not technically feasible, that may be an issue. The concept, I think, is one we should all support. I think currently now, it's it's my office does not police all of these ads or become aware of all of these ads, but to the extent we are, I think there's a compliance issue right now. We see some of these ads run on this kind of media that don't contain the paid for by, and I have a feeling if, if I was to talk to those campaigns, they would say because it's difficult to squeeze it in in this context, and so that, again, was the point of the bill, was to make right. compliance easier. Well, oh, go ahead. But it doesn't make compliance easier to wish that it was easier to do. It, it, it's, Granted. There's a real technical limitation here that I think we're setting ourselves up for real problems. I agree. I mean, I, I, I'll just say I've used a lot of Facebook ads in campaigns. I report them as mass media, and, you know, so that triggers its own requirements. But paid for by, I mean, I'm trying to remember our discussions in the campaign. I think we just we tried. 
-hmm. It's tricky, and, and making it a link. I can Usually, understand. your Facebook ad is either, if it's a link, it's the whole point is to be a link to something that you know, click here to volunteer or something. So you would sort of suck up the value of that. Of a link. On the other hand, the page that says. I want to volunteer for Chris Pearson has a pay for by at the very bottom, but it just I completely support this concept. I just really worry that we're technical. Get a technical Well, I just wonder if it, if someone could explain to me what what in to a non Facebook user why it's so hard to do that when we have a lot of challenges in how we. How we fit all those words in a little teeny thing, and and those ads for cars at the end of the guy talks to him nothing on the end. Yeah, you've seen on internet, Claire. I mean, you, so you use email and you have a server other than just a lunch council server. I mean, you have a an account with Gmail or something else. I do, and so you see the ads and you see the size of those ads. I don't look at them. Well, you may not look at them, but you can appreciate how small they are. On email, you don't get out of email. Sometimes you do. Sure you do. Well, we got to we, we, we get them on. Okay. Anyway, yeah. it's, they're similar. I mean, okay. it's it's the similar size. I mean, it's, it, the challenge is quite honestly just the size. And so the challenge is well, having them legible. It's not yes. putting them down. It's just that they're not legible. Is that right? A friend is, I, 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 I'm happy to speak to some of those questions after Will is done. Sure. Okay. So can I? Go to one other section of the bill sure. then that isn't this. On on the second page, it said it would require local candidates to also uh, declare file a report four days before, which is a new new one. And I guess the issue is that in some local races, there there's a lot of money spent right at, at the end of the, and they don't have. It. And so should we require that of local candidates? I think it's a good idea. Okay. And and we already know that local candidates who raise or spend less than 500 don't have to report at all. So it's only those who are doing over 500. And There's it's only local candidates who have to do the four days. Well, we already have to. You have, thought the, we you have the Friday before, I think. Mm -hmm. is there. And I had written down as a note that the phrase unduly burdensome, mm -hmm. and whether that might raise some constitutional issues that you have got AG. yeah, thirty days, then ten days, then four days, then two weeks after. Yeah. When does it become unduly burdensome? It's worth considering. I think I don't know the, the how case law would come out one way or another on that. What I can tell you, and Senator Collimore, that's right. It's thirty, ten. It would now be four, and then two weeks after. Mm -hmm. In practice, I can tell you most of these candidates haven't hit the threshold by thirty days. We see registrations usually a couple weeks before. Then they'll file the 10 day before report. And very often that's a no activity report because they haven't done much spending at that point. Then they spend a bunch in the last week. This is pretty particular to the Burlington, South Burlington city races. And that's where the concern came from. Not, I don't feel strongly one way or another. Um, Are those races supported by the Secretary of State campaign finance yes. site? How about that to say that filing on those things for a person who's a Luddite is just a piece of cake. There's just nothing to it. It is, is what? It's a piece of cake. There's Even for those to of us it. who aren't. Yeah. 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 Oh, camera. Thank you. Oh, I have to call about once a year and say, well, what was my password? I said, <laughs> I, I wrote down my password, and I still can't remember my password. I'm I, password. I, I have to put have. it on. Don't keep it on a post-it note right on your screen. Yeah. Why not? Cybersecurity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I, I was so well, at least the password's not Jeanette. <laughs> <laughs> well, but nobody from the outside would know that they room together. I mean, that might be a smart thing. Um, yeah. So I had three notes. <coughs> Uh, I had a note to clarify for some other reason that the words promotes or supports a candidate, but we had we wanted to clarify that that, that made a clarification. And also, um, 
who paid for it? it is I think the uh, I don't know I don't understand my own note here. Uh, I'm often not paid for. I don't. That's the whole thing we're trying to get at. It's understanding who's paying for things. But okay, so I don't understand my second note. But I do have this note at the beginning, that, and I'm not clear why we have to clarify further than promotes or supports. But I just have that note. Is there a reason we have talked about that? That, was that, this, that's in current um, law. Yes. That's in current law, and I think there was a request to that we further clarify yeah. that. I would say that that is a totally different can of worms than the current bill, and likely would raise legal implications that you'd want to check in with the AG and Ledge Council on. That supports or opposes. There's a whole lot of case law behind what amounts to electioneering communication and promoting a candidate. And I believe that even in the current law, the sentence that follows that says, regardless of whether the communication expressly advocates a vote for or against the candidate. And that's actually more clarity, I think, than you see in a lot of the electioneering communication statutes. Really? So you guys have said, we don't care whether it expressly says vote for him or don't vote for him, that you can promote a candidate without saying that, without using that language in a way that would implicate this section. And that's, that again, there's just, there's a whole lot of case law out there behind that Six provision. One. Thank you. Six is one whole sentence. Yeah. She's in trouble. Were there any other questions for Will on this? We have an issue with about what text based means, and we started on a conversation about that yeah. whole Facebook hyperlink. Right, thing. I just wanted him to weigh in on the rest of it first. Oh, I'm sorry. Away, before okay. he went away, and then go back to that. Mm -hmm. huh? <clears throat> Any more questions for Will? Yeah, on page four, I have that same note. I would just say, I can't imagine, but Brandon's about to tell us why, right. how short or paid for by could be less doable than paid for by and a bunch of information about who paid for it. But well, a bunch of information. He's about to tell me. Well, we're going to hear, yes. That's, that's why I just wanted to get our questions from you. Okay. okay. Maybe. Sure. All right, Brandon. All right. What can I confuse about today? Well, what, why, can't, why is it impossible to do these? No, I, I, to be very clear, it's, it's not impossible. But it, so I think you've got to look at digital advertisements in a couple of different ways. We can look at social media. Um, and, and Senator Pearson had mentioned uh, that he, uh, uh, he's used uh, Facebook advertisements before and has filed them as mass media you know, uh, expenditures. We do that here. We also are required to do that with the FEC, um, and and we are, you know, for, for paid content that we put out, we do have we do have a disclaimer that we have to do. Uh, Senator Pearson, I saw you drawing a little vote for thing on what on the back of one of these sheets of paper. Well, so you, yeah, yeah. Well. So essentially, the idea. So one one of the things that Senator Pearson had brought up about uh, a Facebook ad that he had put up, um, he put up a, a picture of his lawn sign. And we all know lawn signs are usually the name the office you're running for, and usually vote for or something like that. Or paid um, paid for by. Yeah, um, there's usually usually is a disclaimer at the bottom. Um, if it didn't, and there had to be text that was added to that, Facebook's ad system uses a very particular, very uh, rigid. It was very difficult. But it's, we, I yeah. did the same thing. Yeah. Was, they were not easy to. Um, Text, any kind of ad that consists of, and I'd have to go back and get an actual number, but a certain percentage of the ad is text versus image. Um, that ad will not be approved to be a sponsored publication on Facebook. Um, so they want pictures. So if I'm if I'm running for if I'm Brandon Batham, I'm running for city council, and I want to put a Facebook ad up, and I want to let's say I want to put. Uh, an image similar to Senator Pearson's ad of, of my of my logo or my campaign sign, um, and I'm now expressly I need to do this. You know, I need to do a paid for bite. Needs to be clear and legible to people. Um, 
if I'm doing that, uh, and Facebook determines that the bulk of, uh, depending on the size, the bulk of the ad itself is text, I will send them a request say, I want to, I want to put fifty dollars on the line for this ad to go out to a certain certain uh, size audience. Um, I'll get a returned. Uh, I'll get a response to my request to put that up that either says, yes, this has been approved, your ad is now performing, here's so how you can see who it's reaching, da, da, da. or no, um, your ad was not approved for one of the following reasons, and nine times out of ten with candidates, as, as the couple here who can, who can speak to digital ads on Facebook uh, could attest to, um, nine times out of ten it's because the, te the, the, the advertisement or the image itself has too much text. Um, now you can certainly use Facebook advertisements uh, to promote an event, to promote a link. Is it by area, by characters, you, by pixels? It's by they'll, they they essentially Horatio. take they take a the, let's say your let's say your image is a box. They take a grid. If a certain number of, of boxes within that grid are filled with text, and and Percentage. you know exactly. So they have a They're very sure. they have a very rigid formula for determining whether or not your 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 image has too much text. So, so if you buy a bigger ad, yeah. you're, might, you, might you make it under the line? Do you suppose that's what that's about? Would. <laughs> so I, I I've been thinking about it a little bit, and I'd be happy to hook my computer up to the monitor and room ten or something. We could we could I could show you, but just to give you an example. Like if you had a little ad, this is Peter Welch. And, <laughs> I recognized him. And, and I wanted, and he endorsed me, and so oh. I wanted people to know that. And it said, you know, here's why I'm voting for Senator Clapton. Oh. Blah blah blah. Facebook would look at this and be like, no, nah. this is too much text because this interrupts what we want. Facebook wants is a lot of imagery. I don't know why. I mean, that's their business. It's decision. not about reading; it's about pictures. Yeah, and so, so this ad literally would not be—you couldn't use it. And so, to the extent that we now are asking you to add more text, it, it, it just is. There's just some, some of these are technically tricky. Uh, only point. I, I mean, I know that we, when we do like an ad in the paper and stuff, we put pay for it. You know? by Jeanette White Force and a post up and, or whatever the address mm -hmm. is. What if we what if you just put on these paid for by Jeanette White Percent and didn't yeah. have to put the address and all that on there? It would be less text, but it would still say who had paid for it. And if you really wanted to know who that was, you'd go to the the Secretary of yeah. State's website and look up. And that seems to me that's about the same as doing a link. Mm -hmm. I mean, you still have to go someplace else and look. Claire? So how is this not a choice in the world of Facebook between the message you want to put out about yourself and the identifying information about the finances here? So with, with Facebook ads, um, when, a, when a sponsored Facebook post, which is what a Facebook ad is, when a, when a sponsored Facebook post comes up, it will typically show up as the image or whatever the thing that, that is being sponsored is put up, the title of the page that is sponsoring it, and a small, uh, dis not disclaimer, but, but an italicized marking that says this is a sponsored post or just says sponsored. Um, so uh, an av the average Facebook user, maybe I should set this back, it's possible the average Vermont Facebook user might not have as you know as clear an understanding of that, but um, if, if if we're looking at just image-based advertisements on Facebook, um, you know, e e even if even if we've got the the paid for by disclaimer on there right now, or even if we've you know you, you, you it does limit what you can actually put in an ad. You know, it's the bottom line is one letter could throw you off entirely. It, it really is that small. You and that, a little that, that, that tells you how close you are to your. It line. does. They typically yeah. will 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 walk you through this this yeah. ad has you know certain you know let's say it's, it'll say you know it's got twenty yeah. percent too much text or okay. whatever. Yeah. So, um, so what's like a word count kind of thing. So I I, I couldn't tell you. Um, 
You know, it's it's again, and it and it really does vary platform by platform. Facebook has very different rules than Twitter, which has very different rules from Instagram, which, yeah. and and I think one of the more you know, and to be very clear, we are not opposing this bill. No, no. We're, I think, just trying to make sure that everybody is aware of some of the questions that might need to be asked. Mm -hmm. Some of the bigger questions that we have um, are related to digital advertisements, and as we picture them, to you know, when, we, when you visit a website and you see a banner ad for mm -hmm. for a candidate, or you see a banner ad for for an event or something. Um, digital advertisement buys are not something that most candidates in Vermont for, for public office for the legislature or statewide office uh, purchase directly. And when we think of advertisements, when we think of them with the newspaper, I'll call up the Times Argus and I'll say I'd like to purchase, uh, you know, a six inch, you know, one column with uh, um, advertisement to, to run in tomorrow's paper. Or, you know, and, and you send them the image, you, they make sure it'll fit, and you're all set. With digital ad buys, um, most digital ad buys are done through vendors. They're not, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying, okay, this is the exact layout of the ad. It's going to have this specific kind of uh, uh, attribute. So the concept of rolling over an ad and having the text display automatically, if if a candidate or in our case a political party were working with a digital advertisement vendor. Um, there is no way that we could guarantee that the product that they release and the advertisements that they purchase and the space on which they purchase it uh, is going to meet all of the requirements and qualifications for that are being set forward with this. Social so media, would, sorry. So why, why would I even pay for somebody to put an ad on there if I could be guaranteed that they would do it right and do it the way they're supposed to? I, I can't speak to, to okay. life after this bill, but you know, digital advertisements are dirt cheap, and they reach a pretty significant audience. Oh, okay. That's <coughs> why. And the Facebook. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if the there, there's a. I don't want to offer up more examples of how complicated this is, but there are more, and they're also very elementary kind of uh, options in Facebook. For instance, if I got a good story in a paper, okay. Good way. Story of Chris, uh, you know, One Pearson, else. Senator Sorry. Pearson saves baby from falling in the river, drowning baby. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, I would put that on Facebook, clearly. Right. Then you could put money behind a post. It's called a promoted post. Right. That, mm -hmm. that you can't manipulate. That's just a post that exists. And you either put money behind it or you don't. Right. So you don't have the option to redesign it and then promote right. it. And and so and that's an important option if you're interested in this arena at all. Maybe a solution is that any any ad and there's a lot of variety and they're not all images at all and, and you could do Google ad anyway. Maybe one solution is that whatever the ad is, if you were to click on it and or if you were to interact with the ad in any way, it needs to go. For instance, a Facebook ad that I would do would all go to my Facebook page, mm -hmm. which has my website link and it's clearly mine. Nobody would wonder who paid for that. Mm -hmm. Or if you did something different, in a different arena, it would, you know, in other words, when anyone wanted to figure out who was behind it, it would, we would say that the next stop, if you click on it, or if you try to investigate, if you click what, on the ad itself, if you click on the ad itself, or you hit, yeah, it goes to some place that is clearly owned by a campaign, you know what I mean? So the, the option earlier of, of you go to a website and I said, well, yeah, but if you're going to take me to a page that just said, that ad you just clicked on was paid for by right. here's a percent, and that's a total waste of the, of the ad, it would defeat the purpose. But if it went to my website, that would be the actual reason I was using that ad, and then you would see that the website's no mystery of who's paying for that, it says so yeah. at the bottom. You know what I mean? So maybe like the way to handle all these 
and they are a lot of different options, and I only understand a few of them, would be sort of what happens when you engage with the ad, and does that pull us back to a, a place that I think reasonable people would understand the ownership? I, I can't help but think about the parallel between PAC contributions and this. I know you're already excited about hearing this, well, okay. but we, with the whole idea of campaign financing and saying who paid for this, who paid for this brochure, who paid for the sign, who paid for this Facebook ad, is so when people look at it, they understand it's from the candidate or it's from the Russians. Yeah. Right? And we know that that, and we know that people don't investigate that stuff because we know about the Russians and the big part that they played in our last set of elections. People aren't that curious. People don't read this small print. So I just wonder if it's worth it to try to figure out, no matter what we do, we have to make choices about how we're, how we're gonna be transparent. And in this case, it would be less text because you can only have 27% text or whatever it is mm -hmm. to work around the, work within the piece that makes it um, clear and transparent to the uncurious or incurious observer who's most easily influenced by just pictures. So I, I mean, I just, rather than try to figure out a way to, that makes it more complicated, I, I just wonder if we, if, if it makes it less trans, if it makes it less transparent, I guess, by adding all these extra steps, why can't we simplify the step that's there? And maybe it'll be less useful. Mm -hmm. Um, from a lot of, it, it, it's like our campaign finance, you know, our other, our PAC contributions and so on. It's not super useful the way we did it because it really doesn't tell you who actually put the money in that account that's paying you. But it is an indication that's, that's valuable. So uh, what, what Senator Pearson uh, brought up is, is actually, a, you know, very, would be a very simple, uh, yeah. practical thing to be able to do. Um, and, and that was one of the questions that you may remember about um, uh, what, what I had discussed the last time I was here, which is that um, a paid Facebook advertisement from, say, a first-time candidate uh, who has no universe that they that is already built into their social media um, might actually be worth less than a non-paid Facebook post put out by an established organization with a significant social media following like the Vermont Republican Party or the Vermont Democratic Party. And the same way that valuation of emails would be, uh, an email list would be helpful for everybody who, who deals with them, at some point you may end up having to look at valuation of social media as well. Um, you know, and we, you know, as, as an example, one of the things that would be easy enough for us to do for sponsored or non-sponsored uh, posts alike would be to disclaim at, on, on each of our um, social media platforms that this account is paid for and managed or operated by the Vermont Democratic Party or whatever. Um, and, and, you know, doing that on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, things like that, we may actually already do that. Um, and, uh, and, and in terms of hyperlink, one of the things that, that is mentioned in this bill is a hyperlink from if there's a, let's say there's a banner ad on the side of, uh, of uh, you go to the Times Argus mm -hmm. website and you've got, um, you know, it's a big black and white picture of Claire Air, you know, <laughs> and, and they say, you know, stop raising my drug prices or whatever. Um, if I click on that, it's gonna take me to a website. Right, right now, it'll take me to a website that's probably going to have a whole list of things against Senator Ayer or against uh, you know Democrats or Republicans or whatever. Against me? I, 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 I'm thinking. Oh, I'm this thinking is somebody who's this doing, is work this anywhere is anywhere near the way I. I know. I know. <laughs> well, this is we have. Doing the ad. No, oh. this is somebody doing the no, 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 no. This is oh. this is an outside. Well, and we have. It probably we, happens. That's the reason I call it. It's it's your your yeah. it's a good call. Um, yeah. And and that page. You know, we, we saw this in 2016, uh, where both the Republican Governors Association and the Democratic Governors Association established um, local committees that were registered with the Secretary of State that were not the Democratic Governors Association or Republican Governors Association. They did them as Vermonters for Prosperity or Vermonters for Freedom and Equality or whatever. Um, and so when websites like those go up and digital ads uh, come up and then hyperlink back mm -hmm. to them, 
you know, you're, you're already, uh, you know, there, some of these larger national, to be very clear, um, uh, organizations, big money rooted organizations, they're going to find ways to make it difficult for an individual to find one step to another step to another step. The, the only way you'd be able to know that a certain ad like that was paid for by, let's say, the Republican state legislative or leadership committee, um, you'd go to their website. You'd see the website was attributed to a specific committee that was established in Vermont. You'd go to Vermont to see you're the Secretary of State's website to look up the disclosures for that committee. So much for and you might be able to find out that that was a group that was aligned with the Republican State Leadership Committee. And then you'd have to go through the FEC to see, okay, who's funding them? So it's, it's, um, it's a really, there, you know, digital ads are gonna be really difficult for, especially for some of these national organizations. It'll be difficult for even the most savvy of, of uh, media and digital consumers to figure out who, uh, who's paying for some of these ads. Uh, if, the, if, if, you, if, if wanting to make sure that, that folks here in Vermont and uh, Vermont-based candidates are following the rules, a simple thing like disclaiming all social media platforms um, and 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 requiring I, th I guess that's some of the, some of the some of the digital advertisement stuff is easy enough to do hyperlinking directly to a site or to information about the committee that has put this out that's easy enough to do specifying certain requirements for what happens when you scroll over with a mouse over a digital ad or what certain qualities of that digital ad might need to have, and I guess in the case with Facebook, um, what specific text may need to be laid out, or how legible, or how clear, or how large that text needs to be, may, is, you know, you, you, you run the risk of, of making it impossible for candidates to comply 100%, even with their best effort. Do, do you think it could work for us to say something like either the ad contains a clear pay for by clapton for Senate, or <laughs> is no more, you know, or or uh, or the ownership or some like owning entity of the ad with you know no more than one click to be to something that identifies the who what the entity is. Absolutely, on Facebook, that would it would be Facebook, you know, on Twitter, I think. Yes, uh, I would imagine it would work just fine for Instagram. That if I if I'm on if I'm on my phone, if I'm on a computer, and I see a sponsored ad, and I want to see more about the organization or entity that, that sponsored it, I click on the entity. You know, right at the top, nine times out of ten, there's you know you've got the picture, you've got the title, but there's usually on the side some kind of bio or or, or about this organization, requiring that it be clear that um, one click away. Exactly, it, it could certainly be one click so and one maybe click maybe a scroll of the mouse at most. I think it could because you can you know, almost transfer. You can because it's not all t graphics either. Like I, I ran once some Google ads. Mm -hmm. I can't believe I'm going to give away the secret, but I thought it was great. Who are you going to give it so, to? Yeah. Google ads. <laughs> are you kidding? Don't, listen, all the, Google, all Google. the campaign pros. Is it Google? Uh, is that that Barney Google? So if you say you're a masseuse and you don't have many clients, yeah. you can do a geographic based ad. I'm a masseuse in Montpelier. So you could say to Google, anytime anyone in Washington County searches for yeah. stress, oh. And shoulder, uh, you know, oh, aches yeah, and and massage. Boom! Your ad will show up there. Okay, Can that's like not it? a graphic. That's just text. Can I tell you what happened to me when I ran when Galbraith ran with me? Yeah. Well, not with me, but I guess yeah, I was going to say. he. If you Googled my name, yeah. his, his name, name yeah, came exactly. up first. So that's not a, that was not an image, <laughs> right? Why? But. Because he paid, paid for it. Paid more. Paid more. No, he I do. I that. remember that. Somebody, <laughs> I didn't even know you could do that. I, so you might I, have been the one who told me. So I did something similar trying to reach Canvas. So I did it. If you search for pizza in Burlington, uh, oh, you I'll would just see Bo Pearson. <laughs> and, and my strategy, and, and because if they don't click on it, it doesn't cost you anything. That right, so, right. So, yes. And so we encourage people to click on this all <laughs> over and over and over and over, thousands of times. So the point is that, and those ads are really little. Like you get, you you get, get like 120 bang. characters or something. So it would be, you would make them useless if we made them take up 
80 characters of right. Claire Air Force Center or whatever. So, but there again, boom, if you click on the ad, you have to go, in other words, so if the ad, for whatever practical reason, can't do what we all think it should do, then one engagement with it has to bring you to, to, the, the, yeah. to, to something yes. that's yeah. clear ownership. I, I, maybe that, yeah. I think that suits the needs of our, of our transparency. It, it probably doesn't solve our Russian fraud problem, but... But, but it certainly but does as closer. much as this, because this, well, this is totally do it, you can I, I mean, have this a hyperlink to go, so you still have to do that. You still have to click. You still have to go You're there. right, you're, right. it's one so, click away. Yeah, but you have to put all the text in there to go there, because you have to have the it's link It's just a there. link. Well, they'll it's all, just, all have a, a link. They'll all be a link. They, all they'll those all be ads. A but, but do you Not have to have, the, I the thought the way this blah, blah, I thought I thought that what you were saying is if this little ad appears here and if I want to see who paid for it, it doesn't say on anything on here. Right, who paid for it? I just click on it. You right. can want more this, information of any kind. You right, just click but on this it. what this says is that you have to put the language on there with a, and you're going to have mm -hmm. to see who paid for this ad. Go to and you're going to have, use oh, as many characters as you can. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and the link is a click, so I mean right, it's right. still just the same function. Um, Except right. Well, are you? Yes. Point of clarity. I, if this bill is permissive, right? It's giving candidates an option. I just want you guys to be clear. If you do nothing, reject this bill. The Facebook ad needs the pay for it. Right. 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 This is letting you reduce the amount of language down to, for instance, paid for by. You can leave out the whole name and address. There's a, there's three words that right. say paid for by that are a link. That then you don't have to put link. in what the link is. You just click on the paid for by, and that's this. the link. The whole point of this is that you don't have to have the full disclosure on the ad itself. Yeah. You can reduce it down to a small little link that then has the full disclosure language of it. These are a lot of great ideas for how to not have to require the paid for by language on a Facebook ad. <clears throat> right, right. Now, that's required for better or for worse, and whether it's able to be complied with or not, that's required. I'm just focusing again on this I, bill. I, I appreciate bills. that. But what you're asking for is not possible. It's what the current law is asking for. It's not what I'm asking for. Okay, and the, so the it's current law is for. not oh. practicable. So and that's so we have a problem. Yeah. And so the question is, how do we fix it? Right, but I that's agree not with you. What well, we can rewrite this. Well, it's piece. what it's trying to be about. It's trying to make it to give you another option to comply with that law. And the we're option it's help. giving us is also not workable. I think you're hearing from people who. All I heard in that discussion was that Facebook has a text character limit on their ads. A certain percentage can't be. How many House members text. have used Facebook? This, in my ads? mind, should make that easier to comply with. Because that's can not have true. less text. How is that not true? So with respect, so if I and I think we're we're talking about image-based uh, ads on Facebook have limits with text. If I wanted to just sponsor a post that's you know a diatribe about healthcare or something, and I could put at the end certainly paid for by it would be a link. I could put I could do that. Image-based Facebook ads. Um, if I click on the image, I'm clicking on the image. I'm not able to click on a hyperlink from that image to, you know, and even if even if I put paid just paid for by on a Chris Pearson for for state senate uh, picture ad, um, if I'm clicking on that paid for by, it's not going to take me to anything but a larger version of that picture. The way or, it comes or, out. Or, that now. or or to the page itself, or to the Facebook page itself. Can there be a different time. link? This is really a Facebook question, One. other than the ad link itself. No. No, that's more of a comment that I wasn't understanding. Yeah, that that's right. Like, it's not that we're trying to weasel out. It's that you the can't solution. You can't do the link that you originally right. wanted it to do that's if right. you have the pay for by link. You can't have two links. Yeah, right. can, can we, um, I hate to say this, but can we take about a four minute break and come I, back? I'd love to do like five minutes because my Jeez. back is killing me. Your I've been requested to go to the speaker's office. Pro tab or something like that. Can you stand it? Slum it upstairs. What time? Three. At three o'clock. Oh, I, I hope it's about something. Am I? Am I having a meeting at three thirty? All right. Well, maybe we're. Are we at a point right now where? Would would. I'm. 
So I'd love to think about this slightly further because and come up with language that could be a substitute to what we have at the moment to uh, be yeah. more like. I, I, I actually like the idea of the, one click the away. going on it and getting to someplace that actually says something yeah, that's what I was paid for it by. Suggesting yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's I think that. we can improve on the this. current yeah. situation and certainly okay. this language. Okay. I'd like a little bit of time to think about it. And, yeah. And I'd like to run it by the, the people who did mine also because I, we, we all face this issue. It's curious, did a lot of the House members on the committee, have they done this? I mean, did they have experience with this? No. Yeah. Yeah. Did, they have? did you find that hearing? No. Uh -huh. It was in the car. Okay, so you're, you're going to be on break? Yeah. Um, no, let's. Let's think if we can go any farther with this today, or if what we need is to um, do some thinking about it and, so, and come back to it next week. Next week we will, um, we also have the 624. We'll have some language on that, and it might be, we, talk, we had talked about doing some kind of language that would allow some kind of emergency, the Secretary of State to do some kind of emergency um, election change if there's, if three days before the election they find out that our um, vendor has monkeyed around with all of the, the uh, machines, the scan, the readers, that they're, to just give some emergency powers to, we already give emergency powers to the um, Secretary of State and the election officials to do things like change the voting place to another place because it flooded or something like that. So, the, and 624 is probably the place where it should go. So we can get, we can talk about both of these things next week. So okay. you hold 624. But we have 624 and 828. And, and hopefully then next week we can come to some resolution about both of them. So. Those of you who know anything about technology at all should try and figure out some of the language here and how that might well, work. Have other states tackle it? I mean, do we have any other language like one click away? I mean, what, what's legalese for one click away? And see, I'm not aware of other state laws on this. What? I'm not aware of other state laws on this, but they could have laws. I mean, surely other states are dealing with this if we're dealing with it. They are. Oh, it's, they just have really good ethics commissions. <laughs> <laughs>